So we are recording now. We are live. I am with Kundan Joshi. Kundan, how are you, my friend? Good, Sunny. Good. I'm very well. How are you? Cool. I saw your your the camera kind of zoomed in there automatically. So what what are you using there? Is it some sort of uh, is it the Portal TV? No, right? No, it's the Poly Eye Cube, uh, Eagle Eye Cube. Uh, it's uh, yeah. It just you know, I mean, I can stand set. It'll just take care of its. Yeah, cool, cool, cool. <laughs> nice. So, so Kundan, um, you know, thanks for coming on today. I maybe wanted to just set the context for listeners because, you know, a lot of the times I, I'm bringing on kind of like people in the Bitcoin scene and people who are in Bitcoin. Um, so maybe off the off the cuff, I wanted to let people know that this episode is a bit different. It's uh, so Kundan is, is not necessarily in the Bitcoin scene, but he is somebody who I um, have known for a long time and someone I respect a lot, I look up to and have learned a lot from. He is somebody who is an entrepreneur who's building a company called App Lab. So they specialize in building apps for some really, really fascinating companies. And, you know, to, to put a bit of a Bitcoin twist, maybe, you know, near the end, after we get the kind of Kundan story and all that, I was going to ask Kundan to maybe if he had some questions around Bitcoin, just things that he's hearing maybe amongst friends and family, whatever, maybe it's questions if he has, I'll try and address them. But, but really the goal today for me was more, um, and like I said, is, is so maybe, let me back up. So, so Quentin, you and I, we met, like, when was it? First of all, I'd like to start with when we met. Do you even remember when the first time we met? 2005, maybe, maybe. Holy 2000, cow, 2005. Oh my God, yeah. that's like 15 years ago. Yeah, okay. 15 years, yeah. <laughs> Jesus, okay, you still look the same. But uh, but where was it? It was probably at an I Indo Canadian Chamber of yeah. Commerce. Uh, so that's like a, what was it? Like some sort of Chamber of Commerce between India and Canada. And there was like a youth group right that's, that's, that's right kind of young there. professionals group uh which you were both part of here yeah there you go and i had just moved out from from uh from you know from edmonton and i'd living here for a few years and i was just trying to find my groove and i knew i was passionate about india i knew i loved canada because i'm from here i knew i love business and that's all i really knew and so i kind of just started attending these things and and you were one of the first people i met at these events and I got to admit, man, you were the, one of the first people that I had met, let's say aside from my dad, that I just we, we like saw. I was just like, oh, my God, this guy is so capable because I'll never forget. We were like we were like organizing events and doing this and doing that. And one of our first events we were organizing, you were like, oh, we were like a whole bunch of us. We're like, okay, we're going to do this. We're going to get the venue. We're going to have to ask these guys as speakers. And literally, I think by the time we even got home, You'd already figured everything out. You'd already called everyone, booked the place. You guys, guys, it's already done. You guys just, you know, I don't know, just make yourself useful. <laughs> and I was like, who is this guy? Like, how, how can he be so like, you know, how can he be moving mountains? So anyway, so since then, Kunin, I've always, you know, loved uh, everything you've been doing. And with that, let's maybe, you know, start with your story, man. I'm, I'm really curious uh, to kind of know where it starts, uh, where it takes you, uh, yeah, let's let's start there. Where do, where do you want to begin with your story? Where does it begin? Yeah, sure. Maybe we'll begin with India, right? Since you nice, brought nice. in India, Canada, love nice. for both of the countries. Maybe let's start there. Okay. Uh, so born in India, Mumbai, India, the financial capital uh, of the world's largest democracy, I guess. Uh, so born there, uh, I, uh, uh, I mean, I did my education till my first year university in India. Uh, brought into a family uh, who really valued hard work, uh, valued uh, really being authentic and uh, and responsible for your own actions, valued education. Uh, so I, I was doing my first year engineering. I was very inspired by my mom's side of family who were entrepreneurs and uh, I had done some internships with my uncle and I was really inspired by entrepreneurship and but I, my dad was an engineer, so I knew I wanted to be get into engineering. I loved math anyways. So that's where my life in India was uh, when my parents moved here to Canada uh, to embrace this as their new, uh, uh, new country of choice. And I followed them. Um, I didn't have a choice at 19 years uh, age. A yeah. uh, bit of a reluctance, if, if, if I may, because, I mean, at 19, you have your friend circle, you are learning new things. Of uh, course. But when, when I moved here, I mean, uh, the moving process was filled with reluctance. But when I moved here, uh, I think one thing I had I'd always uh, 
uh, been brought up with is an open mind, right? I mean, hey, it's a new country. Let's look at this new country for all the good things it has to offer. And, uh, I, and I love that process of getting myself assimilated into uh, this new country, starting, uh, my edu starting my university from scratch uh, at Western University, where I started pursuing software engineering uh, in my, and that's where sort of my journey of entrepreneurship in many ways began, where first year university, uh, after I finished my first year university during the summer, uh, I couldn't get any other job, but a sales job. And I was like, okay, sure, let's let's try it out. And I realized I was pretty good at it because I was I was looking to learn more about this country, about people in Canada. Uh, and sales gave me an opportunity to talk to as many people as possible. And here I was, hey, you know what? I'm new to your country, but I have something that I can help you with. Yeah. And I just felt empowered by that process of, hey, you know what? Through this process of sales, I'm actually adding value because. I believed in the product. I believed that there was something which I was trying to, and I was selling high-speed internet, Rogers high-speed internet cool. at that mm -hmm. point. I believed, hey, you know what? Use, and, and technology is something I loved already. Uh, you know what? Using this internet, it can really help you do A, B, C, uh, really try to understand their challenges. Hey, you know what? Do you have challenges communicating with so-and-so or, or finding the right tool, so-and-so? I tried to understand what their challenges were associated with internet use that time and tried mm -hmm. to present them. Hey, here's a solution for you. And hence and what, you what, should year? Use... what year is this? This is in 20... 2001. So I moved to Canada 20, in 2000. Almost 20 years ago. Okay, okay. So 20 years ago, yeah. So, uh, so yeah, so that's where it started. I was the best salesperson that Rogers had ever had what? in that kind of a role. Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. It, it, during summer, I mean, it was, I like, I made three figure income in three months. Huh. Imagine that, yeah. <laughs> Holy Sorry, six crap. Figure. Did I say three figure? Six figure income in three months. Damn. So it, was, it, was, it was insane. And uh, I was doing really well, but obviously uh, I had to go back to school. I had to finish my engineering. Uh, so, so I said, hey, how about this? I'm moving back to London, Ontario. Let me start a branch for you so that I can uh, still continue doing this because mm. obviously... I can understand why you don't want me to let me go. I don't want to let go of the money I'm making either. So let me do that for you. And that's where the entrepreneurship journey began. I began. I was doing that as a consulting gig. I got, uh, I was able to procure. So it was basically a mall kiosk. If you've been to a mall, you have that small, whatever, I mean, four by two kiosk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, where you sort of stand and people come by. I just had a different approach. I had the kiosk, I didn't stand behind the kiosk. I just made sure in like my perimeter of, I don't know, hundred meters, anyone who came in, they got get, got to see me with a smiling face, right? <laughs> so so that's what I did. I, I Then I hired people to be in that kiosk and I sort of made that my first entrepreneurial gig, which I was able to grow from one mall to about five malls in London, Ontario. And I just realized, hey, you know what? This world of entrepreneurship, where I get to form a team, I get to build a culture with that team, I get to really motivate and inspire the team to for uh, for a bet, for for solving problems of multiple people. I just got fascinated by it, and my love of technology and entrepreneurship sort of got meshed in together for me to figure out, hey, you know what? Okay, this is where I want my hmm. my career path to go. Uh, so that's where it all started. After my graduation, I sort of started working, uh, started taking on odd sort of uh, uh, these gigs of, okay, let me build a website for you. Let me build an e-commerce store for you. Let me do this for you. And I started doing that myself. I was, I sort of had a bit of a design uh, brain, uh, a bit of a, develop, a technical brain. So I started doing that myself. Then I realized, ah, you know what, I'm actually better at this than that. So let me just hire a tech guy. So I hired my first tech guy, uh, first developer in India, sitting out of uh, a flat, an apartment that I had in India, which no one was using. So I was like, okay, let me make it useful. And instead of rent, I mean, let, let me make a deal where instead of uh, paying you salary, I'm letting you live there for free. So that's how I hired my, 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 uh, my first guy. And, uh, and then it sort of grew from there. Uh, where started taking a lot more consulting projects, started enjoying that. Right there at the cusp of, in 2007, pre-iPhone days, where a lot of, uh, uh, like, obviously, I was fascinated by technology. I was in the business. I was attending a lot of conferences, always there in terms of what's happening. So I, I sort of had, I was in the know of, 
things where I knew that something like an iPhone was around the corner, like the, the experiences uh, of that, that a smartphone will provide to consumers is going to be of high degree of value. And from building to desktop applications, I started sort of pitching apps to my clients where I had purchased a few uh, uh, like notebooks for, for Microsoft at that time. I mean, uh, uh, so sort of tablets, obviously, uh, from Microsoft. And I was like, hey, you know what? If you're in sort of web application, if you do it here, it might look nice, right? And interesting days because in 2007, I had to put an agenda item of defi definition of an app. And sometimes I spent uh, more than, can you still hear me? Yeah, sometimes I spent uh, around two hours explaining what an app was at that time. So, uh, but I mean, that was just at the cusp of uh, iPhone being launched. Uh, I realized that, you know what, a, a short form experience for a particular task of an application will be, is going to be an experience of the future. Uh, since we started pitching a lot of those apps, investing in a lot of them. And when the iPhones was launched in the first iPhone store, we had half a dozen apps that were launched as a part of that for various clients of ours. And then from Wait, that so point- hey, could you, So this is App Lab at this time or do you guys call it something different or? We were called Joshi Inc. Then we were Joshi Inc. Right, right. Yeah, I remember so that. We were, I remember that. Okay, so okay, okay. Based on Interesting. But so you're saying you guys were on top of this app thing before iPhone even came out? That's right. Yeah. Whoa, yeah. So, epic. I did not know that. Okay, that that's yeah. crazy. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So you already had five or six apps out in the app store when and, and this is we're talking iPhone apps, right? Or Android as well, or both. Uh it was mostly iPhone. iPhone. Yeah. There were some Blackberry and iPhone apps, mostly iPhone. Uh we did some Blackberry, it, did some Windows apps for the tablet as well. And what was it though? Because it wasn't at that point super clear, right? I mean, especially if the iPhone wasn't even out yet, that that the apps would be so ubiquitous so um and you know and, and by the way i'm calling this this segment building on bitcoin right and i think one of the most kind of common things people build is obviously apps right so i think i think this conversation is actually probably more relevant than many of the other ones but but really curious like how did you what was your insight there in terms of like how, how are you able to say hey you know this this is going to be a thing and you didn't even have a version of it there was probably no what facebook nothing right no twitter <laughs> Yeah, I mean, see, the thing is, right, it was more about the concept of mobility and what functions can people do when they have an ability to do those functions while being in motion, right? Uh, building applications that you will use when you are sitting in front of a desktop tied to your computer versus ability to perform some of those tasks, maybe not all of them, but some of those tasks, some of those use cases while you're on the go, while you are standing about in your organization on say the manufacturing floor or while you are walking around while you are getting ready whatever that is what are those use cases that will be useful so the entire aspect of mobility started that conversation around mobility started changing at that point right i mean obviously we're working with a lot of enterprise clients so it was more about hey as an enterprise which aspects of your business would benefit from being mobile from having that mobility in a sense, right? And for me it was, I mean, technology mattered a lot and human experience always mattered a lot, right? So how are, how whatever I'm building, whatever I'm creating, how is it really creating a better experience for the end user? Because if that is solved, then the company I'm building it for will benefit as a result of that. And apps or smartphones the open, like just lit that bulb that, oh wow, okay. Now with this tool and again, right? It was looking at tablets. It was looking at BlackBerry. It was looking at uh, other smartphone versions, prototypes, which had failed before iPhone actually arrived. Looking at that, hey, you know what? Something's around the corner. Like for example, mm. right now, it's smart glasses, right? I know when Apple launches their smart glasses, I know it's going to make a big difference, right? So, but what do we have right now? We don't have iPhone glasses. Yeah, Google glasses was whatever a bad version of it, but we have various other glasses like North created their own set of glasses. You had Magic Leap creating their own set. So you had all these sort of almost their almost commercialized technologies, which were not there yet, but gives you enough of a view to really figure out what are those use cases that are going to take 
some of those interactions, some of those experiences, some of those pain points uh, and create a solution for them in a, in a much better way and create a much better experience uh, in essence. So, so that's where we are with smart glasses right now from augmented reality start, standpoint is where in 2006, 2007, where we were when it comes, came to mobility and smartphones and tablets and so on. So, so that's in essence what, what was going on there. Yeah. Hey, Quinn, by the way, uh, I think when I met you, I was actually finishing up engineering at U of T. And when uh, I actually, I, I was taking a couple of marketing classes as well. And one of my, in one of my classes, we were tasked to, invent something and just like you don't have to actually invent it but like pretend like it's invented and like how would right. you kind of market it and i'm not kidding you 20 years ago it was smart glasses i, <laughs> I did a presentation on nice. it so head of the curve baby okay no i didn't actually make awesome. it though so ideas are a dime a dozen um but okay so i, I like that though i like the augment uh, augmented reality that definitely feels like yeah. And I, I've thought a lot about that. Cause it's like, I have this thing on my face. Like, you know how valuable that real estate is? Like, ah, you got your ears, you got your eyes. Um, so, okay. So cool. Um, but what about your story then? What, where does it, where does it take you next? So now you've had this, and by the way, what year are we in now? When you say you, you launched the, when the iPhone was it 2007, 2008. You so said? that was 2007. So 13 years ago, right? And, and we actually couldn't, you know, you brought up Blackberry too. Let's maybe just touch on that a bit. Cause I mean, I remember Blackberry like it was yesterday. I remember when I met my wife first, she, she was like all about the Blackberry. Blackberry was a thing and it was a Canadian thing. And it was arguably like 90% there, right? It was just a little keyboard that, 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 that Steve Jobs was like, let's get rid of it. That was kind of the aha. But, but do, do you think much about that? Like how Canada could have been, you know, like the Apple and, and maybe are there some like l lessons to be learned there for like more just stepping back as like, uh, you know, I mean, this is a big deal, right? Like iPhone is the, the biggest company in the world and, and literally BlackBerry was scratching at the surface, at the corner. Um, and they weren't able to, you know, capture that, right? But but I wonder, like, do you, do you think about that much at ever? Like, why that happened? And yeah, I I do actually, I do. And I mean, there are a couple of, I mean, there are obviously several case studies on why BlackBerry failed and how they they missed that cycle of innovation. And there there's a huge use case there or case study there, just about. How do you, I mean, as a technology company, you never stop innovating. You never ignore the cycles of innovation. You never stop looking at, uh, uh, at what's coming up and how do we ensure that as people's experiences, people's expectations from, uh, uh, from technology keep on uh, uh, sort of changing, how do we adapt to that? Uh, as well as how do we just stay on top of Moore's law, right? As a, as a tech company to ensure that Hey, as of now, based on the current viable version of Moore's law, uh, this computing power and this hardware limitations, our current technology makes sense. But as that continues to change and improve, mm. we, the, in, the, the scale of innovation has accordingly does need to uh, be compatible to that in essence. So there's a case study around that. But what you touched upon is being a Canadian story, right? I think about that a lot. And I mean, I mean, as, as you know, we have an incubator and we have a few startups as a part of that. One of the one of my passion startups as a part of that is the one where uh, is a marketplace or is a is a eco it's an online ecosystem for startups. And and the reason why we created that is precisely for that. How do we ensure that Canadian startups and scale ups? are not limited in their ability to dream, are not limited in their ability to grow and scale and be global companies. And there is a case study there in that BlackBerry example and tons of other examples that you'll find in Canadian case studies where they didn't hold off long enough, where they didn't, uh, they didn't keep, uh, they didn't stay on their, their grit and their resilience and their continued ambition to grow a bit further to become a global company enough before either getting acquired, before either getting, uh, uh, be, before either uh, getting an exit done a bit too early. Uh, and a lot of that is not just, is a combination of the ecosystem and how the ecosystem works in Canada for, uh, which is a combination of VCs and angels and, and how the entire ecosystem works and the mindset, the mindset of truly, uh, of, uh, of, uh, uh, of being ambitious, the mindset of creating global major companies, right? Mm. I, 
So there's a lot around that. Uh, mm. uh, I mean, uh, we might need a session just to talk about yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. That, <laughs> that was that was the seed for us creating that particular initiative, and it's it's operational now. And I'm very proud of what we what we're doing so far, connecting uh, various scale ups with investors, connecting them with all different players in the marketplace to really give them wings to say, hey, you know what? We want to support you through that entire process. You don't need to feel at any point that I, because I'm a Canadian startup, I can't be ambitious enough. Because mm. I'm a Canadian startup, I don't have access to a big enough market, and hence I have to exit a bit early or devalue my valuation and whatnot. So, wow. um, but but yeah, there is a Canadian context there as well, where mm. if BlackBerry was a U.S. company, uh, maybe it would have been a bit different. Mm. Yeah, and then yeah, now you see companies like Shopify, right, that are just like kicking butt and uh and so i think i think that they're kind of like the new and i heard recently that they're even bigger than they're the biggest company in canada now like they are they are yeah right that is amazing so congrats to toby okay but just to go go back to your story though uh you know joshi inc i guess app lab was still kind of baking uh in the oven as like an idea but like what is so you 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 app uh, iphone um the store apple store launches you've got already apps in there but what 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 happens then kundan Continue on that journey, right? I mean, continue mm. building great apps, continue build a great culture. And now fast forward after 13 years since that moment, where are we now? We have uh, over 100 employees from one person. That was Woo. me. We have uh, uh, we've created more than 600 apps uh, for some of the largest clients in the world, uh, which includes Unilever's of the world and Samsung's and Dell's and Petro Canada and JBS and uh, Gateway Casinos and the list goes on. Crazy. Uh, and continue to further it for every single client further the experiences. Uh, The one thing I'm most proud of is the culture that we've built at the App Lab, a culture of innovation, a culture of teamwork, uh, a culture of resilience that uh, like, I mean, and I mean, obviously tech has been a beneficiary of despite all the challenges uh, pandemic, this pandemic has posted, uh, posed to us. uh, And, uh, and we are sort of riding that wave as well at the App Lab. Uh, however, couldn't have been done if it didn't have a strong airtight culture to really drive that and continue that growth during a challenging year. So uh, so yeah, so so that's one thing that I'm most proud of, of building a great culture too. And your team is global or mostly Toronto or India, Toronto or? Uh, so mostly India, Toronto, few in uh, in uh, in US, majority in in Toronto. Our office mm. is uh, is in downtown. Uh, well, right now everyone's home, <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, uh, yeah. So mostly Toronto, some in India, some in US, uh, and then few others globally spread out. So interesting. So so couldn't I just curious. Um, you, as I mentioned, you know, there's a, like I've been in the Bitcoin scene now for almost what seven, eight years, right? And so I have a lot of people in my circle that are are Bitcoiners, or and one of my specific goals is to encourage more people to build on top of Bitcoin, right? And like I said, apps are kind of like the obvious uh, thing. And so I mean, I'm sure you know you'd want uh, some of these people to maybe reach out to you to get help. But before even getting there, um, you know, as people think about, okay, well, let's just let's just use Bitcoin as an example because it's something I'm familiar with. But like, if people are thinking about building apps, like, what are the I don't know, maybe two or three things that they should be starting with? Like, where do they even begin? Is there a website? Should they be I don't know, like, starting with uh, wire diagrams? Should they like do a spec? Like, how, how, what does that process look like for people? And and what it, what have you kind of seen be more effective and more optimal in terms of you know? producing output yeah certainly i mean one thing i've seen is uh, when i when i specifically talk to entrepreneurs or founders who want to build an app around bitcoin right mm. uh, they uh, i've seen more often than not uh, uh, a tendency to skip the core uh, fundamental process for building any venture or building any product in essence mm. right just because a bit it's a bitcoin related startup doesn't guarantee that it's destined for success in essence mm. right the core fundamentals of a product market fit the core mm. fundamentals of hey, we are we solving are we have we validated the pain point of the end user have mm. we validated the solution for that end user and are we going through that that journey in essence right i mean uh, for any idea stage startup uh, with, a, with a single founder or a few founders. I mean, one book that I always recommend is The Lean Startup is a, is a great book to pick up and just start understanding the fundamentals of 
building a product what is needed how do we go about creating a set of hypotheses and identifying that these are hypotheses that hey you know what i'm assuming that my customer wants something like this i'm assuming they have this problem right and now how do we break it down into mini hypotheses and start validating each of those assumptions mm. and sometimes it's just making having conversations sometimes it's having the research but there's a process associated with that lean startup is a great book there are several other books uh, and and frameworks to help with that as well uh, but uh, but yeah that's that's the core start let's validate the product market fit then start understanding okay you know what now let's figure out what is that minimum viable product what is the the bare bones uh, key features the unique features that we need to build in order to again test and validate the hypothesis in order for us to say okay great now we know exactly what's required now we have set all the milestones associated with okay what's the budget where is the money coming from what are what do we need to achieve in that money how do we go about launching the product and continue in that process in essence right very interesting very interesting um Okay. So, okay. So maybe just to go back. So we touched a bit on like kind of your story, India, you know, Rogers, you talked a little bit about sales, uh, the technical elements and kind of brought it all back and, and talked now about your business. Um, but just to kind of zero in on, on app lab, um, you know, it sounds like you guys are doing great now, but just wondering, have there been like, what, what did that kind of the 13 years, like if you had to maybe, I don't know, find like two or three milestones in there, were there kind of stages that, that you went through? I mean, cause like, you know, I think the first year even like of a business is like hell. Like, I think, I, I don't, I don't think most businesses make it out of that first year or two or three years. So, but curious, like, you know, what did those first couple of years look for you, look like for you guys? Um, I mean, I always remember you to be super like kind of energetic and positive and passionate. And so I assume that obviously helps, right? Like, just because like, you know, it can be a very lonely place, like to be an entrepreneur, I think. Um, and you almost have to have this ability to kind of psych yourself up. You know what I mean? Like when there's no one else in the room, you got to be able to look in the mirror and be like, ah, <laughs> <laughs> but just curious, like what, what did the arc of, you know, the app lab story look like, you know, to go from zero to a hundred, to go to be able to serve Samsung and all these, like, did you guys have to, you know, visit like processes? Was there like, you know, kind of like systemic thinking involved in terms of like how to approach this? I mean, yeah, just curious about that. You know, you, you mentioned that your mom, his family had some experience, but you know, business is one of those things where you kind of have to just learn, I guess, as you go. Right. Yeah, no, totally. I mean, uh, yeah, it was an interesting journey. Uh, uh, obviously, always uh, completely self-funded. Uh, I mean, even funded. I mean, uh, when I started the company, I had no savings to to catch on to either. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so in essence, started from let's sell one project from that revenue. Let's continue to figure out how do we do, how do we survive for the next month, mm -hmm. and taking it sometimes one day at a time, sometimes one month at a time. But you know, I mean, through the journey, I mean. Uh, uh, there are two key components, right? I mean, one is obviously the team that you surround yourself with, right? I mean, it's extremely important, extremely important to make sure you have the right people on the bus, that you have the right mm. partnerships that you're working with, uh, who are uh, who are going to make sure that uh, they are smarter than you in those elements of the business. I mean, entrepreneurship involves, I mean, build, running a business involves like hundreds and hundreds of different things, right? And as much as, you need that energy, as you mentioned, uh, you need that uh, coachability to learn as many of them as possible. You can't fundamentally do all of them. And the critical pieces are the ones that you need to have the right people on the bus to take care of, right? Uh, but the second part, and even the more important part, right? I mean, uh, I read this book called 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership uh, mm -hmm. by, uh, uh, and, and one of the, the first law uh, in there was the, was the law of lead. Uh, in essence, which means is the leader is the lid of the organization. So your leadership level as a leader, especially if it's a single leader, as I was, is in essence the ceiling for the growth of the organization. If you don't continue growing as a leader, the organization will not continue to grow, right? So that's the fundamental element of 
really growing your organization. One of those aspects is realizing that you need a strong team around you. One of those aspects is realizing that failure is a part of the journey and how do you embrace failure, not just accept it. Obviously, acceptance is important, but you embrace failure as an opportunity to learn more because it's just failure based on uh, your fear of judgment of that failure as opposed to uh, what failure really means because it's, it's a label given by yourself. So, so going through that journey of really realizing how do you define failure? How do you embrace that failure? How do you constantly keep your mind open to constantly absorb and learn and just be constantly thirsty for knowledge by having a complete open mind uh, and, and then truly being, uh, get, having that ability to, to stay completely present, right? As a leader, you have to make decisions in that particular moment. But how you, I mean, but if you're reacting to every single moment that's thrown at you, uh, you're basically letting the external conditions uh, uh, dictate the direction that you're going to take your, your organization or, or, uh, or your, your own career path in essence, right? Whereas ensuring that you are, uh, that you're controlling your destiny, you're controlling your journey involves being mindful, involves being fully present in every moment to make the right decisions through that. So, so yeah, so I mean, that's been the key element to ensure I'm raising my game as a leader. I'm, uh, and I'm, uh, I'm constantly ensuring that I'm, I have the right people, the right leaders who are able to take the, the same initiative on into the organization. Um, and then, I mean, obviously the, the innovation bit has been extremely crucial, right? I mean, early in the game, we realized that, you know what, I mean, just by being a services organization, uh, we won't be able to scale as fast as we want to uh, based on uh, what our goals were. Uh, so launching a product and a platform. So we have a platform that allows us sort of a low code app platform that allows us to build some use cases extremely fast, get to that MVP, uh, and then start, continue that journey because validating the product is so important. And we realize, hey, you know what, we are reinventing the wheel in so many of these cases where we just need a product to validate it and then we can continue building on top of it. So we created that core framework, core platform for building apps where version one can be launched a lot faster for specific use cases like a mobile shopping app or an on-demand marketplace or, uh, or a telehealth app. Uh, we sort of created those, those use cases and now we are constantly improving that platform. So the version one is a lot better, is more scalable. So that version two, we don't have to start again. We still continue on that journey and so on. So constantly being uh, aligned to who your, what your customers' challenges are, constantly al being aligned to who your future customers are going to be, and then ensuring you're choosing your path accordingly, you are nimble enough that you can pivot along the path Mm. Are, are some of the key things that I think I've learned through the process. That was great. Hey, Quinton, um, can you, do you mind rewinding a bit? You, you talked about mindfulness and presence, right? Um, and I think in a previous conversation recently, you also mentioned that you're, you know, practicing meditation more and things like that. Uh, what, yeah, what's, what's that, you know, journey been like for you? And, and yeah, and what does that look like? Because I'm, I'm very fascinated. Uh, yeah, that's been a, that's been a very important uh, journey for me. I mean, uh, in a way, uh, a year back, uh, I mean, I, I, I had to go through a self-transformation, to be very honest. Uh, about 10 years or so of entrepreneurship uh, meant constant battles, constant wars, and you continue to carry that baggage on your shoulders, uh, especially, again, I'm, I'm still the majority shareholder of the organization. Uh, and, and hence, uh, uh, I mean, I'm still fairly engaged in the organization itself, right? Uh, so it was very important for me just to, to realign myself, right? To what my purpose is, what my personal goal is. I mean, I very well know what App Lab's purpose is. What is my purpose? What am I here to do in essence, right? Uh, so it was important for me to simplify that in essence, right? And I sort of went on a journey of self-discovery. Hey, really, let's, let's, you know, let's step back a bit. Let's really understand, have I lost a few things in this journey? Uh, have, I, have, have I been carrying some baggage associated with some perceived failures through this journey, some challenges that I've, I've had to overcome through this journey? And I came on the other path, realizing the importance of 
really getting, uh, really having full acceptance of the past, whatever that is, uh, whether you consider it positive, negative, really freeing yourself from the, the constraints that you set yourself for the future. Uh, like, uh, and, and a lot of that translates as fear of the future because, hey, will we be able to achieve those goals? Will we really be able to do what we are set to do? Will we be able to survive next month or next year? Will COVID shut us down? Whatever those fears are, right? They, they are the past and the future impose restrictions to us being fully ourselves. And when do we succeed? When do we live in the present? We succeed in the present, we live in the present, we win in the present, everything happens in the present. So in, in our lives where I'm working whatever, 15, hour, 15 16 hours a day, uh, multitasking, doing 20 tasks at a time, uh, going back to back meetings all day long, you sort of lose sense of the importance of that present of being present, of being living in the present, of winning in the present, of enjoying the present, of contributing and adding value in the present. And that was important for me to just say, hey, you know what? Okay, that let's reset. Let's have that reset button. I want to now realize that, hey, you know what? Whatever impact I make, it will be in the present. And that's what life is about, right? I mean, we sometimes complicate it a lot more by just being stuck in, in one of those arcs in essence. And in order to stay present, right? The first was realization of importance of being present, right? So if that's not, if that's not checked off, then okay, let's go through that journey to figure it out. Once you figure it out, then you need a practice in order to optimize yourself. And when you say optimize yourself, every aspect of yourself, right? Which is mind, body, soul, intelligence, all of those aspects, how do you optimize those? on a daily basis. So you are actually being present on a daily basis and being present means being mindful, being fully there, being fully aware, being fully in, right? Whether it's a conversation I'm having with you right now, a conversation I'm having with an employee, a conversation or a relationship that I'm building with my, uh, with a client of mine, each of those conversations, am I being hundred percent and doing whatever I can, because whatever I do in that moment is going to determine if I'm going to achieve my goals or not, right? Sure, on, a, on my whiteboard, I know what my goals are, where my organization is going, where I am going as my personal journey. Okay, great. Now that you put it on paper and you've aligned what go, like what activities are going to achieve there, your job is done. Now, no point worrying about that future. Now let's make sure you're bringing your 100%, right? So the practice, going back to the practice, so that practice has been an, a very important part uh, of just actually, talking the or walking the talk in essence i read a book called 5 am club by robin sharma a year ago and i really loved how he talked about that 20 20 20 principle right wake up every morning at 5 am 20 minutes of exercise 20 minutes of meditation well he says 20 minutes of reflection i sort of made my version of uh, reflection gratitude and meditation and 20 minutes of learning right so those three aspects are extremely critical exercise to get rid of the fear, uh, the hormone of fear, right? I mean, when you are when you start sweating first thing in the morning, you get rid of that the fear hormone, uh, so that okay, now you've struck it off. Energy is there. Then meditation, where you're getting into that state of uh, so sorry. So first one for was for to meet the needs of the body. The second one, meditation, to meet the needs of your soul, so that you feel centered. You are energized and relaxed at the same time. That's sort of the state of meditation. And obviously there. Are, several practices to go by that. I, I like this app called Calm is simple enough and very easy to follow. But, uh, uh, but meditation gets you in that state of just being still in a sense, right? And the third is learning where you're making it a point on a daily basis to keep your mm. mind open. I want to learn something new. I want to absorb something new. Uh, and there's a combination of a gratitude exercise there. Uh, I mean, when I, starting the, my meditation session with that gratitude exercise, brings that smile to my face, gets the positive energy flowing into my mm. body, gets my mind in that positive space. Uh, and, and reflection uh, allows me to figure out, okay, what do I need to learn and con being in the con continuous path of learning without ever being restricted by the ego of ever feeling that I, I, I know it all, right? I mean, I read this one quote, which I absolutely love. It's when you know it all, it's it's what you learn after you know it all that matters, right? So 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 that was extremely important for me. You know, every time I catch myself saying, oh, I know it, 
I, I, I take a break and say, no, I don't know it. I, I probably know only, uh, only half of the things that I think I should know, but then there's like triple those things, which I don't even know I don't know, right? So really being open and exposed to learning as much as possible and doing that practice on a daily basis of nurturing my, my body, mind, soul in that particular so In the last seven days, how many days did you actually do it? In the last year, I've done it every single day. Oh, I haven't missed I like a it. single day. Yeah, I yeah, love I it. I love day. it. Wow, wow. Yeah. Um, okay, so I did read that book. I also have a morning routine. I agree with you that I think it's probably the single biggest point of leverage, like meaning days that I wake up at five and do my morning routine, the quality of that day and my output versus days that I don't, night and day, like. Oh. 10x maybe even uh, potentially. Totally. Um, so I agree with you there. It is easy to fall off the horse. Well, maybe not for you, but uh, just curious, uh, have there been some some little hacks that's enabled you to stay on track for that 5 a.m. Uh, wake up time? Like as in do you go to bed early? I don't know. Do you have some ritual or something? Because like, I find like, you know what I mean? If I go to bed at two and two or something one day, I mean, good luck getting up at five, right? So just curious, but, but I'm really glad we're talking about this because because these are the things that nobody talks about, but they're the things that give you the most amount of like benefit and like, uh, you know, happiness. And and so anyway, so, but yeah, but curious, would be any, anything, any comments on that one though? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's being, I mean, when you have that mind open, right? Uh, to learn more and when you have, that mindfulness to be aware at every single moment, you, you are in that self-exploratory mode all the time, right? So I started looking at, okay, what's, I'm, I'm, I'm up today at 5 a.m. and I'm not fully motivated. Now that's a sign where tomorrow I might fall off the ladder, right? So, so, what, so what, what happened yesterday? Oh, wait a minute, I didn't sleep on time. I, the, the hour before I went to bed, uh, I was, there was a lot of screen time. There was a lot of, activity that didn't allow my brain to get fully rested. Okay, let me learn a bit more about that. Then I caught on to another book called Stealing Fire. I'm like, okay, you know what? How important it is for my sure. brain to be in the optimal state for the right type of activity I need to do, right? So, mm. so according to Stealing Fire, there are a couple of other books there. You need to guard your one hour before sleep, right? And, and importance of sleep came to me after that as well. When and do you go to know, sleep? When do you go to so, sleep to be able to wake up at five? So about uh, around... 10, 11. 10, 11. Yeah, okay. So about 10, 11. Uh, I was a guy who used to sleep three hours a day uh, for like 20 years. I did that and I abused my body by doing oh. that. Yeah, so it was, it was terrible, terrible. So, uh, and I thought I was, wow, I can sleep for three hours and still work great, right? So <laughs> I, was, I was proud about it, which was the worst part, right? Uh, but realizing that I need to break that cycle, right? I mean, yeah, I'm a, I have proven that I'm the most hardworking guy that I can ever find. But how does that matter, right? Uh, <laughs> am I the smartest working guy? That's what I need to achieve, right? So, mm -hmm. so, 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 yeah. So it was. Uh, so that was one of the aspects, really making sure I'm guarding my sleeping time mm. as well as I'm guarding the hour before I sleep, so I get fully Makes rested. Sense. I'm fully and to be honest, when you keep, when you consistently keep on to the course, and when you start realizing the benefit it has, right? It's that's it's it's, it's addicting. It's addictive, right? Mm. So it's and that's that's been my main goal. Cool. Um. Okay. Okay. So I guess. Okay. So do you feel? Is there anything else you wanted to touch on with regard to App Lab in general? Um. You know. Again, fascinating story. Like, great job. Like I said, I I don't know too many people that work harder than you. That's for sure. And smarter. But uh. But anything else you want to share on that point? Like, as in, you know, um. Yeah. Like I said, I I I I mean, I I mean, I mean, I almost want to say like we should we should maybe collaborate a bit and then try and figure out I know we've talked about it in the past but some some sort of like program or easy onboarding thing for for bitcoin people to like you know start making apps because there's a lot of interest in bitcoin now and what else are you going to build if you're not building an app right so so I'm sure and 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 I find it a bit surprising how um hard most people find building apps like even massive big companies they don't have apps. Like, yeah. and you know what? The funny thing is, when you go to India, you see companies like Flipkart 
which are like, which is like the Amazon or whatever of India, they don't even have a website. Like they literally just have an app. <laughs> so you start to realize like there's something crazy happening in this world. But, but any, any, any kind of closing thoughts? I mean, I, I, there's a couple other things I wanted to obviously touch on, but uh, anything you want to mention on the App Lab stuff that might be instructive or helpful for others that, um, that are building businesses? Yeah, I mean, uh, when it comes to apps in general, right? I mean, uh, what's what's important is why apps, right? Like you mentioned, Flipkart. Why do they only have an app and not even a website, for example, right? Because the advantages that app provide for that particular context, that mm -hmm. doesn't necessarily mean that app is the solution for every single I mean. context, right? Mm -hmm. It's important to understand why apps enable uh success for a particular venture right i mean it occupies real estate on your phone it it basically any scenario which requires uh loyalty which requires uh recurring users which requires your customers to be hooked on to your particular product app is the way to go in essence right in terms of that recurring usage being in that loop in essence and adding maximum value on a regular basis in essence right you, so sorry, sorry, sorry continue 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 i, wanna, I don't want to interrupt you can no, no, go ahead. That's okay. Feeds. News <laughs> feeds. Are they something to be looked at? I mean, I don't know. I've been, or. So, I mean, so see, I mean, <laughs> when I, I mean, the kind of apps that we build, right? I mean, for us, that impact and value is very important, right? So, so we usually, as opposed to let's make an app that's most addictive, our narrative is usually let's figure out an app, let's make an app that's adding most amount of value, right? So, so there are a lot of apps mm. which are extremely addictive, and but they're not really adding value, right? So, so mm. and 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 at, and and you might get some short term success in those type of use cases, but in the long term, right? Are you are you truly being impactful? Are you really creating a charter for uh, for a highly valuable organization, right? So that's, I mean, our, that's part of our purpose of really creating impact with every experience that we create. So, uh, so, so that's where we, I mean, obviously there'll, there'll be clients who'll come to us and say, hey, this is what we want and that's fine. We'll still try to figure out how, to, how are we really adding value to, uh, to bring people as a part of that equation, right? The KPI is, yeah, sure, your business outcomes are a great KPI, but the more you focus on your end users KPIs, uh, the more you will be aligned in terms of being a really valuable brand, a valuable, valuable company in essence, right? Makes sense, makes sense. So, so, uh, so, so yeah, so I mean, so, so from that point of view, really understanding the power of apps there and power of mobile mm. really helps to figure out, okay, what are the use cases? What are the pain points that we can solve, right? We have a lot of startups or startup founders that don't have a Bitcoin uh, background or enough knowledge come to us and bring up an, a use case, which we know while we go through the exercise that this use case is better solved using blockchain or using cryptocurrency or whatnot. And then there will there'll be an injection point at that end, right? Uh, and then we have startups who come to us and say, hey, because I want to build something on blockchain or Bitcoin and maybe this, right? Without really being a very technology focused as opposed to being problem uh, and solution focused in essence, right? So they are sort of two sort of diverse gaps. And that's where, as you mentioned, right? There are a lot of opportunities for those universes to to overlap a bit more in essence and we've done that on a one-off cases sometimes hey you know what you're talking about that concept here's a problem here's the person who has that pain point and they're trying to solve it and i think a marriage there will be a lot more useful as opposed to thinking in your in your own silos right so for people who want to do something who want to build app when it comes to uh bitcoin or blockchain as i mentioned before go to that route, go to understanding the users, the consumers, their pain points, their challenges, uh, in order to then let, let the problem dictate the solution, let the solution dictate uh, what platform or what technology you want to use to solve that problem, as opposed to, okay, now we have a technology, what can we solve? It, it very rarely works in that way. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so that I think that was very helpful, uh, Kundan. Um, okay, so my, one of my last questions I ask, and I don't know how relevant it might be because like I said, you're, you're not really like, you know, knee deep into Bitcoin, but is there one truth that you believe to be true that most others in, I usually say Bitcoin would disagree with you on, but you can pass on the Bitcoin thing and, and pick up on, let's say just generally like entrepreneurs, maybe like tech entrepreneurs might disagree with you on, but whichever one you want. 
Sure. Well, let's handle entrepreneurs. I think probably the Bitcoin, you'll probably be a better person uh, <laughs> to speak on that. So, uh, uh, so, so let's I've talk about the entrepreneur one. So what is one that you believe that most other entrepreneurs would uh, disagree with you on? So the one truth I believe uh, is, I'll go back to what I mentioned earlier, is the most important element for being an effective entrepreneur, for being an effective leader, uh, is being fully present. Uh, I, the reason I say that that's something a lot of entrepreneurs will disagree with me on is a lot more emphasis is given to future planning, to scenario planning, to really how we ensure the five-year, 10-year goals are all in check. All of those are important, but don't get higher importance than what you're doing now, how mm -hmm. you're taking care of yourself now, how you're taking care of your people right now, how you're taking care of your customers right now and mm. finding every single opportunity in the now to help mm. and be fully there to really serve right i mean i i believe i'm a big believer of the helper mentality uh goes i mean uh uh and i mean obviously you will relate to it so uh so i'm a hindu so hinduism uh, the, the key responsibility of any individual is to follow the path of dharma or righteousness. Uh, and, and the key principle for the path of righteousness is compassion. Uh, mm. so, so compassion holds just a lot of value in terms of how you are serving other people, how you are helping other people, how mm. you are really being there to add value to any individual you are in that moment with. Fine, mm. you are in a moment with someone for 15 minutes. Now, either you'll say, you know, I'm not interested here. So let me, I'm just waiting for the 15 minutes to pass versus I have 15 minutes. What's the most amount of value I can add? Maybe by just listening to them fully present, maybe mm. that last minute, because I've listened to them so intently for 14 minutes in that last minute, I can add one piece of advice or one piece of nugget or one piece of experience share that will help them in their journey moving mm. forward, whether with no attachment to any expectations or what I'll get back from them, but just being in that journey of adding value, adding value, being compassionate, being uh, full of giving in every moment. You know what? I mean, the law of nature will keep on bringing it back to you and you'll mm. keep on reaping the rewards in, in various different directions. Mm. Maybe not with that particular relationship that mm. you happen to invest in. But if you keep on doing that by, again, mm. living in the present, by being compassionate and giving in every single moment, mm -hmm. it will come back. And a lot of, I mean, and I, to be honest, as you know, right, I mean, uh, like when I started the organization, as you mentioned, I was full of positivity. I was full of energy, whatnot. During the course, I fell prey to that as well, where I realized, you know what? This is just too much, man. And let me just focus on numbers. Let me just focus on performance. Let me just focus on blah, 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 right? And I stopped looking at people. There were so many employees I had where I, I did not cultivate that individual relationship with them mm. in the past. And I realized, hey, wait a minute. I mean, this person was working with me and I thought just because I'm paying that individual salary, I don't need to invest emotionally in them. I don't need to mm. invest in creating a relationship with them. Mm. No, that's not true. I had moments when mm. I was in a room with them, I did not even ask them how they are or how their parents are or how their kids are. Why? I mean, they are such an integral part of my life and for my company. Why did I not do that? Right. Mm. So really by being fully aware, and just being on that journey, you, you are set to gain so much more and a lot more uh, as an entrepreneur, as a leader, as an organization, as a culture that you can build to bring people together uh, to, uh, to, to collectively march towards your collective purpose, your collective vision in essence. Mm. So, yeah, well, I, well I, I think very well said and uh... And I would, say, you know, I think this, 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 I think I've got a couple of videos in the queue. So this will probably come out on the first or something. So I think this will be a great video for people to, you know, get, get, get some nuggets, as you said, right. In terms of that'll really help them because, because if I, if I had, if I had one thing that I, I would want to share, it's that too, what you just said is, is just being present. Um, and, and I also wanted to say that, you know, um, like when we recently, when you and I touched base again, after some time, I did notice that like, let your, let your level of presence was deeper. And it, it comes off in like little ways. Like it's like when you finish talking, for example, or when I finish talking, it's not like the next sentence comes like 
you know, a millisecond after there's like a little pause and you can tell by people's body language and whether they're taking you in or whether they're thinking of the next thing, whether their eyes are like shifting. And so to me, and I've been studying and trying to cultivate presence too. Right. And, and again, I'm not the best at meditating every day. And, you know, I, I did realize though, is that, that life is a meditation, right? Like, like by, by, by focusing on trying to remain present, whether with your child or whether you're with your work or your wife or whatever, it's like it, that in itself is meditative, but, but I don't think that's an excuse to not meditate either. Cause like you said, that helps you kind of deepen your practice and it helps you go. Um, okay. Okay. So um, I like that. I like that. I like that. That's great. Um, so I, we, we've done almost an hour. Um, there were a few more topics I want to quickly touch on before we do a bit of a Q&A, if you have any things for Bitcoin or whatever, right? Um, one, first, uh, well, the next question I had was around AI. Have you, I mean, App Lab, AI, it's AI is everywhere and nowhere. It's like, <laughs> ah, you know, if people are saying they're going to take over the world. Some people say it's garbage. I mean, but just, just, just curious, what are your thoughts on AI as an entrepreneur? Are you reading about it, messing around with it, thinking about it? And like, how do you, how do you suggest other people kind of, you know, position themselves for, for what, whatever AI means? <laughs> yeah, totally, totally. I mean, as you said, right, AI is integral. AI is integral, so you can't afford to ignore it. Any organization can't afford, afford to ignore it. Uh, and, uh, and cultivating the power of AI is extremely crucial, right? I mean, uh, we have, I mean, uh, we launched Innovation Lab uh, as a practice, uh, which was basically a practice focusing on, on emerging technologies about four, five years back in essence, uh, where we started a practice specifically for AI, started a practice for AR, VR, augmented reality, virtual reality, IoT, and so on. And AI was the most important part there, right? How do we, in the similar lens, in terms of improving user experience, uh, creating applications that are smarter, more intelligent, how can we leverage the power of AI to do that a bit better? Now, again, that practice has evolved and we take on a lot of AI projects by itself in terms of machine learning or data science and so on, but our, still, our core focus is our platforms, mobile shopping apps. How do we make that experience a lot more personalized? By looking at the data, by creating those insights and making that experience seem like this app was built for you uh, because we want to make sure that the, the journey that we take you through that entire shopping experience is very aligned. We know that you are, let's say, for example, a grocery app because we build a lot of grocery apps. We, we take you from a use case where, hey, we know that you are a vegetarian. Why should we even show you a meat category? Right. We know that historically you have uh, shopped uh, for uh, for organic food. Are we showing the organic food uh, pre-sorted to be at the top as opposed to other types of food? Uh, how are we using conversational experiences, voice experiences at the right times that flow really well with that user journey, with that customer uh, journey itself? Uh, so, so those were those have been the main points. Personalization has been the key element there. Uh, the other element has been, so we do a lot of work in, in telehealth and telemedicine, even telepsychiatry. How are we, how are we deriving insights from, in an anonymous way while maintaining privacy, deriving insights from the user behaviors, the interactions between the, the, the practitioner and the patient or the service provider and the consumer to, to ensure that for that particular individual, we are creating a better experience. But overall, we are adding more insights either even that in specific phase for that psychiatrist to provide a better diagnosis or provide a, or create a better program moving forward for that particular patient. How are we really using data and the intelligence and predictive, whether it's to predictive analytics, machine learning, whatever you may want to call it, to, to create a, a much better experience, right? Now, when it comes to using augmented reality or IoT, there are other layers that need to be resolved. Like, I mean, OCR becomes a very important uh, toolkit when we are building an app for augmented reality. I mean, one of the apps that we recently launched, pull up the app and the camera will detect whatever you need to be parceled out. So it's a, it's a, it's a courier app, right? Courier on demand. So I need to send whatever, this particular uh, fish uh, bowl to somewhere else, right? So 
the app will detect exactly the dimensions, figure out exactly what type of car. I mean, this is not a great example. Let's say you are in Ikea and you picked up four different sets of furniture and you those boxes are lying in front of you. You scan those boxes. Now it determines, hey, you know what? You need this amount of uh, space and hence a particular van that's out there which already has two different loads but there's space exactly for that much load should be routed to your particular um, uh, to your particular location to pick that goods up whatnot right so in those kind of use cases ocr plays a big role of really understanding really visualizing and create and, and providing those insights so so several different use cases obviously and uh, and i mean again they, i mean uh, i mean the pandemic has Really, I mean, one positive thing the pandemic has done has just accelerated digital transformation on every single level, right? And uh, the impact of that on automation and AI is tremendous. Uh, so, so we'll see acceleration in terms of use cases uh, in 2020 already and in 2021 by by 10x than what it was anticipated mm. in uh, uh, if if pandemic wasn't there in essence, as well as ability to collect a lot more data during uh, this time uh, has been. And, and Quentin, so you, you spoke about, I mean, so I, I think that's great. And then the AI you're talking about are really just like what I consider to be kind of more like narrow bands of AI. Like they're very application specific. I mean, you could argue that, you know, Google is, is a form of AI, you know, the Tesla or, um, you know, the iRobot vacuuming upstairs is, 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 is AI to some extent. Um, have you also read or thought much about this like more, um, I don't know, you could say more well-developed AI that might be a bit more holistic, a bit more sentient, a bit more where all of it kind of comes together, you know, um, something that, you know, like I think a lot of people are talking about now, right? Like whether it's Elon Musk and um, a lot of smart people are, are talking about how, you know, we might uh, in the next 20, uh, you talked about Moore's law, right? I mean, the singularity, the technological singularity refers to the Moore's law and talks about how given this exponential increase of information processing power, it might be that, you know, we find ourselves in a very, very interesting place where a thousand dollar computer is able to have the, let's say the processing power of all of humanity um, on it. And what does the world look like in that type of environment? Um, but have you thought much about that? Just curious, is that something that uh, has come across your radar? Like, you know what I'm talking about? Like like a, course, a more, like a, a general AI. I think that's the, the right word. Yeah, I mean, so I, I still believe there's a long ways to go to have that general mm -hmm. AI, right? Um, one obviously is also based on our intentions, right? Uh, a lot will depend on our intentions as problem solvers uh, in terms of how we really want AI to help us in essence, right? Uh, I mean, it's, it's, I mean, the obvious use case, uh, obvious impacts are, hey, I mean, by next year, one in five people, one in five workers will be using AI of some format to help them, right? Half of the tasks overall that are done by next year will be done powered by AI, right? Those are direct impacts and there are obviously uh, results of each of those impacts, right? Uh, but a general AI, I mean, um, uh, is, is still long ways to go, to be very honest. And we study that in, in sort of my, at micro levels, right? For example, we build a lot of diagnosis apps, right? Now, we've seen that how important it is for us to create hyper-focused diagnosis apps versus the competitors that are creating generic diagnosis apps. Mm. And, the, and the amount of errors uh, mm. or the error percentage in those is so high that makes you realize, no, it won't help, right? And mm. you, I mean, you try to create an app which, okay, fine, give me your symptoms and I'll give you a diagnosis regardless of what it is. The, the error Doesn't margin work. is way too high, right? So, it. so it's more it's more harmful than beneficial, to be very honest. And I feel that there's long ways to go for that. And my argument is, do we even need to go there in a sense, right? I mean, mm -hmm. there's more power in the new niche use cases mm -hmm. as opposed to trying to create something generic because the chances of fault and errors are very high in that uh, generic AI. Uh, platforms will do a much better job at creating those generic AIs because they have already divided it up into those specific niches and collecting that collecting that data across 
the entire domain for all types of users, right? But then are you, sorry, this is just like a question in my mind right now, but I'm just curious, are you noticing more and given again COVID and how we're living in this digital age, are you noticing more entrepreneurs starting to incorporate video capability into their apps just to get that human in the loop, that touch, like to replace that physical location type of thing? Like, are you, is that, is that a trend or, um, and, and like, are there like open source like platforms that people are looking at or is it just kind of like zoom seems like it's uh taken over the world to some extent but uh, just curious like uh yeah yeah definitely definitely we're doing a lot of that uh whether it's telemedicine apps telepsychiatry mm, apps mm. Uh, uh sort of a consultant apps we're doing a lot of those right like hook you with a consultant have a quick five minute chat for something that you need help with we're doing a lot of those uh so yeah definitely video has been incorporated in various aspects uh now more than ever because people are more comfortable with a video conversation as opposed to earlier where I mean, we were creating more, uh, so in specifically in healthcare, we were creating more of uh, a practitioner at home on demand uh, app scenarios than, uh, than a video based uh, telemedicine app, right? Uh, yeah, there are certain platforms we use uh, Twilio a lot. Uh, Twilio has a API uh, set that we integrate as a part of our apps that gives you the video capability. Uh, Zoom has an SDK, uh, which works decently well as well. Uh, Zoom has a Zoom healthcare, SDK very specifically, which includes the hip hop, Epeda compliance uh, sort of stack and all of that stuff. So, uh, so yeah, so I mean, those are the top two. There are a bunch of other WebRTC and WebRTC with mobile SDKs, uh, open source solutions as well that can potentially be used. These two are, I mean, we use these two the most because they come with the track record. Cool. And, uh, cool. Hey, yeah. Uh, so, so can you just to kind of rewind a little bit? Um, I'm wondering if I should mention, uh, maybe I won't mention his name, uh, but uh, uh, somebody who was in our ICCC, um, you know, whatever events way back in the day, I'll mention his name, Shabab. Uh, he's, yeah. He recently, you remember him, right? Yeah. He yeah. recently, he just yesterday messaged me a screenshot of a conversation I had with him back in 2013, where I said, uh, where he congratulated me, I think, for getting married or something. And I said, uh, thanks. Have you heard of Bitcoin? Um, and I don't think he responded. And like seven months later, I was like, dude, when I told you about Bitcoin, it was $7. Now it's 700. Like, have you heard about Bitcoin? <laughs> um, so I'm trying to think you might've been victim to some of that, you know, um, soliciting by me back in the day. I'm just trying to remember, uh, I've been kind of talking about this for, for some time, but, but curious, Kunin, like, you know, as a technologist, as somebody who's, um, you know, kind of seen this the space develop at arm's length. Um, are there any sort of I don't know major questions that 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 you have that I might be able to address or, or um, yeah help? Yeah, I mean, I mean, on a similar story. First of all, right? Mm. I mean, uh, I think yeah, I not I think I know you gave me my first uh, Bitcoin, whatever. I mean, it was a portion of the Bitcoin. You just sent it to me. I'm like, hey, here you go. I've set up your account. Now you can get started on your Bitcoin. So remember, you did that, I don't know how long ago. I mean, in the power home days, right? Uh, that was I remember uh, that. 10 years ago, maybe more than that. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. 10, 7, 10 years ago. So, uh, so I remember that. And that sort of got me started on that journey, right? To just explore more and figure out what's, what's, what's needed. And I mean, to be honest, right from there, I was, uh, I mean, you were, for you, I mean, you were always thinking about the power of money and really how money works and getting deep into that, right? I mean, uh, and I really admired your thought process there. And I can totally see how that thought process really helped you, like, I mean, accomplish amazing accolades in the in the blockchain world and uh, in the Bitcoin world, right? Uh, I wasn't thinking from that point of view, but what fascinated, because I wasn't, uh, I didn't have a similar relationship with money or similar thought process related mo with money, but I had a thought process related to solutions. And, and that conversation where it inspired me was the power of blockchain, right? A power of really having decentralized systems in essence, right? And, uh, and, uh, and, and, and that's always had me fascinated. We built 
several applications residing on blockchain or utilizing blockchain in some way, shape or form, whether it's career, whether it's within neo banking and open banking and whatnot, and, and various other places outside of the financial services world. So, so my question to you will be more on the blockchain side, because that's the side that fascinates me more, although obviously going from whatever 0.1 cents to 25,000 is obviously a fascinating story. And maybe, I mean, uh, maybe well, that's a question I'll park in terms of your, I guess, your heart is the, this is the peak or is it going further? Maybe I'll ask you that as well. But I think my first question of curiosity is related to blockchain, right? I mean, you've seen during pandemic how the digital transformation shift has come to be, right? And, uh, and I believe that uh, the, 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 uh, the impact that blockchain should have made uh, maybe five years ago, right, has always been, uh, it hasn't achieved to its potential in terms of the number of applications should have been on blockchain, how the world should have incorporated blockchain in a lot more applications, a lot more digital transformation process and whatnot. So my question to you is the impact of pandemic on digital transformation acceleration what are the key use cases you see accelerate because of block that are based on blockchain? What are the key advantages you see or, or, or that should be taken using blockchain uh, in the world of digital transformation across industries? So it doesn't have to be a specific industry. So that's my question. Yeah, I mean, I guess my first thing, my, my first gut reaction Kundun, would be to say that Bitcoin, not blockchain, in the sense that blockchain is like, uh, it's a bit of a loaded word in the sense that to me, in my experience, the reason people try and go towards blockchain is because they go, well, the Bitcoin thing, I, I, I mean, kind of missed the loop, missed the whatever opportunity and, and but blockchain is, is interesting. I, I, I kind of have a hard time differentiating the two because I see, like, first of all, the word blockchain is a bit made up. Uh, the word blockchain as one word doesn't even show up in the white paper. So it's, it's, it's like block and then chain. He's actually referring to a chain of blocks. And I feel like the banks did a great job of, you know, because they knew that Bitcoin was maybe a bit too threatening, but they felt like the innovation behind Bitcoin was exciting. So they wanted a way to talk about the innovation and look like they're being innovative without actually touching the really dirty word with Bitcoin. Cause you know, maybe bad guys use Bitcoin or whatever. So my, my initial reaction is to say that I, I do believe that the real application of blockchain is Bitcoin, which is uh, like a, you know, uh, <laughs> this future of money if, if in the short. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and, 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 uh, and I think a lot of people have kind of lost their way with Bitcoin because they've, they've tried to find ways to build on blockchain. And I haven't seen too many exciting or interesting cases. Um, that's not to say that it's not possible. So now, now to kind of like, and, and the reason I think Bitcoin is so important to keep our eyes on that more than even blockchain is because, um, because money represents one half of every transaction on earth and, and money in itself is flawed um, as we can, you know, talk about later or whatever. But, and I, so I think solving money does, a lot for the world um, and kind of staying singularly focused on that application is I think uh, critical to Bitcoin's kind of goal. Um, however, there was a, a project called Ethereum that launched uh, and you and I'm friends with some of the people that that, that, course, that yeah. uh, part of that and uh, and Ethereum's kind of claim to fame was we love Bitcoin but we can't do anything with Bitcoin. We can't build any programs on top of Bitcoin because Bitcoin is like a calculator almost. It's like, it's hard to build, you know, programs on top of it. So their big innovation in Vitalik's innovation was why don't we make a blockchain that's specifically for people like what you, what you just said, which is like for specific applications, right? So you want to build a lending thing. You want to build a decentralized exchange. You want to build cute cats, like, and like, you know, cats, it's called crypto kitties. Like it's so popular or was at one point, if you want to do anything like that, Ethereum, do you know what the word Turing complete means? I mean, that's kind of a bit of a red herring, but Turing complete means like you're a programmer, right? So you know what if, then, while loops, all that stuff. Yeah, yeah, so of if course, Bitcoin yeah. can do plus minus really well, Ethereum had the ability to do for loops, while loops, like uh, right. they have the ability to implement full Turing complete programming languages. Right. And right. that was kind of the, the aha. And so anybody who's looking to build um, on top of a blockchain usually gravitate towards Ethereum. 
I personally have a lot of concerns around Ethereum and its true decentralized nature. Just the fact that I told you, I know the people who started it and, you know, live in Toronto and this and that <laughs> to me is, is scary because it's like, you know what I mean? Like uh, there's leaders to this thing. It's not like a true like internet. It's like kind of everywhere, anywhere. So, and, and so now what's happened is there's been groups of people who've looked at Ethereum and they said, oh, that's very interesting. Why don't we build solidity on top of Bitcoin? So use Bitcoin security, decentralization, no leader, blah, 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 blah. But how do we build applications on top of it? So one of the teams is called RSK. I just, uh, I released my interview with Diego, who's the founder of RSK yesterday um, on my channel. And, um, and what RSK enables you to do is design any program. So you're like, Sunny, I want to build Facebook on top of Bitcoin. You could use RSK to do that. You could also do it on top of Ethereum. I want to build, you know, whatever, Twitter on top of, of Bitcoin. You know, you could do that with RSK. Um, and so, so to answer your kind of question is if you are really looking to build applications, the one that I recommend is RSK and, you know, another one might be you know, something like Ethereum, which is decentralized. But again, I have, I have a lot of concerns over it. Um, and then your question around price, I think Bitcoin is essentially saving technology, meaning it's designed to, it's limited it's nature. And, uh, and I believe that I used to, maybe back in the day, I used to, I, my prediction used to always be, I think Bitcoin is going to a million dollars of Bitcoin. Um, today, I believe that a million dollars will be the floor, not the ceiling. I believe that when we get to a million, we'll be warming up just because of the way the world is panned out, the way the money supply is planned out, the way, you know, governments are, are acting, the people's attitude. I mean, there's just so many variables that, that makes me believe that once we hit, you know, a million dollars, it'll just be getting warmed up. Um, but again, you know, I'm not a financial advisor anymore, so nobody should be <laughs> taking my advice. It's just my, uh, my, my two cents. And, and I do think, and I could be wrong again completely, and I hate making price predictions, but I will. Uh, I think Bitcoin's <laughs> going to 10x in the next year. I think it's going to go from whatever, 35K to maybe 350K. And then we will most likely see a catastrophic crash of 60% or 70%. And then for the next five years, all my friends and family and will think I'm a failure and Bitcoin's a failure, even though it's at $50,000 when it was at $5, you know, like nine years ago. Um, but people have short-term memory. So and again, people will build and, you know, infrastructure will be built. And in the next kind of phase of, I think, Bitcoin will emerge when we hit a million dollars, maybe five, 10 years from now, and then it'll go to 10. And uh Digital gold, digital gold. You know, you're from India, you know, your mom, I'm sure, wife, everyone loves gold. Um, maybe not the same way, right? But but I can tell you my wife likes Bitcoin more than gold now, 100%, because we could buy a lot more gold today than if we would have just invested in gold, that's for sure. Um, so yeah, so digital gold, it's this future of money. And I'm super passionate about it. And like I said, let's, you know, if, if I get some interest and get some people like wanting to build apps, I'll, I'll bring them your way because... Uh, yeah, I love what you do, Quinton. Hey, dude, with that said, I think we're at like an hour and 20 minutes. Any um, any other questions on Bitcoin? If not, you know, do you want to maybe just give people where they can, you know, follow your th thought, your consciousness? Like, is it Twitter, LinkedIn? Do you blog? Like, what's your, how do you kind of get your message out there and all that kind of stuff? Yeah, certainly, certainly. No, I mean, I think you answered like, like probably one of the best questions. So, so thank you for, for that answer. Uh, a lot of people... I know have similar questions. So I think you answered that really well. So really appreciate that. Uh, I'm very active on LinkedIn on pretty much all platforms, but LinkedIn is the best way to get hold of me. Uh, so it's Twitter. Uh, so, so one of those two works. Hey, couldn't, uh, I just remembered that you, you were probably the first for a lot of things for me, but you were the guy that got me onto Twitter. I remember yeah. I was literally in your office and you're like, you need to get on Twitter. <laughs> like Twitter, what is this bird? Uh, but yeah, dude. Uh, so thanks because like I live on Twitter now. <laughs> yeah. I love you. Have way more followers on Twitter than me. So kudos <laughs> on that. So, I probably waste too much time there too. But, but I love Twitter. So thank you, man. And 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 again, thank you for being an example, dude. Um, you know, for me, and I'm sure for many others of of what hard work looks like, of what you know making a difference looks like. So really, really happy we got to do this. No, and likewise, Sunny. I mean, uh, you were very kind with your words in terms of uh, how uh, you feel I've impacted you, but likewise, right? I mean, you've had a big impact uh, on me as well. I've looked at you as, you know, someone who's always innovative, always, I mean, in those 
early days when you weren't fully into into bitcoin right you were trying out things based on analyzing the curve right i mean whether it was solar whether it was robots. bitcoin <laughs> whether it was robots exactly i mean you were always uh, <laughs> looking at that curve analyzing that curve so well and that was a big inspiration for me in terms of really looking at the curve looking at where things might go questioning yourself looking at different applications to really see to validate that hey is this really a curve or is going to flatten very soon so i've uh, so yeah so i mean anyone who's watching this and continues to follow it i mean you are a great person to follow so continue doing that and continue spreading this knowledge cuz that knowledge has inspired me and i'm sure has inspired a lot more people as uh-huh, well that means a lot coming for you man i really appreciate that and you know could in long term i do have i get this like vision that that great things will happen you know um and uh and yeah and i also you know just like how blackberry was like everywhere i remember in engineering everybody would have a blackberry and then it was nowhere and then apple was everywhere the same way you know if if people kind of look into the future and i mean you know i think steve jobs like him die i think it was paul graham from y combinator that he said this in a youtube video once he was talking to somebody at apple and uh he was asking them you know you know who's the next steve jobs is there like like who's going to you know make apple relevant this is like a couple of years ago right so it's probably not a great story but um the guy said what there is no next steve jobs like you know there is no next steve jobs and then what paul grip said was is like you know that's sad obviously because steve jobs has done so much for all of us but it's also exciting in the sense that maybe you're the next steve jobs maybe you're going to build the next device that's like in everybody's pocket and you know Steve Jobs can't really compete with you cuz he's no longer here you know god rest his soul so you have a better chance <laughs> yeah so so maybe 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 our few maybe everything we've done to date is just uh, going to be eclipsed by what we do you know 10 years from now oh totally um, and i mean you know i mean uh, i get asked a question a lot of times right how do you predict the future how do you really figure out what to back on right mm-hmm. and i mean just i mean uh just i mean i think uh Uh, giving you as an example right i think why you are able to do that and if i can give my thoughts over it i think you have a combination of curiosity doing enough research to gather as much data as possible and actually putting yourself into it right so with each either of let's say they take those three examples robotics solar and uh, uh and, uh, uh, and and bitcoin right in each of them you had curiosity you were asking questions you were trying to figure out is it like yes no what not right so that curiosity was important obviously curiosity mixed with bit of a vision of understanding where things could go and really having that that thought process second you did enough research so you really entrenched yourself into each of those really understanding the know how importance figuring out the existing use cases so you really put yourself into it and the third thing is you actually did it you actually worked for a robotics company you launched your uh, company in solar yeah. you went into like started like teaching cl- learning to teaching classes uh, to getting into financial advisory to starting hosting that meetup group on blockchain to starting to work for a, blo- a bitcoin company so you sort of did it so you did all those three components mm. so i think using you as an example i'll say anyone who wants to sort of try to predict the future that's the way to go have that curiosity do enough research and just do it right get into it start doing it and do all those three com- combination you'll get enough confidence by all the data that resides and that's sort of what what it is right i mean any decision requires enough data but at the end of the day then your uh, when that curiosity is is uh, you your gut feeling is validated enough can never be fully validated but validated enough then you can sort of start getting on that path like you did way ahead of uh way before any everyone anyone even thought blockchain mm-hmm. or bitcoin would be anything yeah man no i appreciate that uh it means a lot um yeah man yeah that's been anyway this has been this has been a great great call <laughs> man like all of our conversations are and if you want to do this again anytime soon uh could then i'm down man i'm down okay so with that said couldn't i uh, just one more time to so kundan joshi on linkedin and uh and then the app lab website i don't think you mentioned that just so people... oh yeah the app lab website for sure so the app lab so t h e a w p l a b b so two b's l a b b dot com i mean single b will get you there as well but that's the that's the core brand and again same the app lab with two b's on linkedin twitter instagram awesome Facebook. 
whatever you want. <laughs> okay, dude, go, uh, you know, conquer the world. Happy holidays, <laughs> you know, give your family a big hug and, uh, and yeah, let's, let's, let's make 2021 one to remember. <laughs> oh, wonderful. Totally. Totally. All right, brother. Is this is awesome. Happy okay. holidays, Sunny. Thank Happy you. holidays.